Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Calhorn, Director of the Surgical Movement Disorder Center at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. I'm trained as a neurosurgeon, which means that I work with a team to offer surgical therapies for people with movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia. Our movement disorders team offers one of the most comprehensive programs in the Washington, D.C. area. MedStar Georgetown University Hospital is the only center in Washington, D.C. and the Virginia area to receive the Parkinson's Center of Excellence designation by the National Parkinson's Foundation. This designation recognizes high quality care, our work in the community, caregiver support, as well as basic science and research into the cause and cure for Parkinson's. You can take place in our webcast in a couple of ways. You can ask questions, which we will get to in a few minutes. You can submit them now by going to the chat box feature on your computer screen or a mobile phone, typing in your question and hitting send. If you're watching on Facebook, type your question into the comment section. You can also follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AskMedStar. Joining me to talk more about surgical treatments for movement disorders is Dr. Fernando Pagan, a neurologist and director of the Movement Disorder Center at MedStar Georgetown. Also with us are two of our patients, Bill Espinosa and Jim O'Connell. Both have had successful deep brain stimulation surgery at Georgetown to improve their Parkinson's symptoms like uncontrolled movements and shaking. Bill is retired from active service as a Navy submarine captain and had DBS surgery in 2013. Jim is a speed writer for a news agency and had his DBS surgery in 2012. But first, let's start with Dr. Pagan, who can explain what are movement disorders. Well, Dr. Pagan, t talk about how patients can manage their, their movement disorders with medication. So we have various types of movement disorders. The, one of the main ones we're going to talk about today is Parkinson's disease. And in Parkinson's disease, as you know, Dr. Cahorn, we start to lose those dopaminergic neurons prematurely. One of the ways that we can manage this medication is by replacing that dopamine deficiency with medications that help us produce more dopamine, as well as medications that mimic dopamine or make our levodopa, or, or which helps us make more dopamine, hang around a little bit longer. And these are some of the adjuvant treatments. Another way that we treat different movement disorder, disorders like the central tremor, this is usually a disorder where you see uh, tremors usually during posture. In Parkinson's, the tremors are usually during rest is when you usually see those. A central tremor, you can treat those with medications that, that inhibit the tremor a little bit. Some of the most common ones that we use are propanolol and mycelene. And these medications can dampen the tremor. Sometimes we could use uh, heavy weight or heavy weighted objects as well. There's even a new device that with a person having a, 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 a tremor, it can uh, inhibit that so the food can stay on, on a utensil. Uh, and then the other way we also treat other movement disorders like dystonia, where th this is an abnormal muscle contraction. We can either treat this with botulinum toxins or we can use medications that help loosen up the muscles like muscle relaxers. But sometimes our medicines just aren't as effective as they, they need to be or they lose the, the long-term efficacy of them. And that's when uh, we think about other alternative therapies. If patients reach a point where medications are no longer working to control their uncontrolled movements, surgery is an option. I've operated on hundreds of patients with various movement disorders. At Georgetown, we've been performing these surgeries since 2003. So we consider ourselves to be very experienced and very comfortable with this procedure. The surgery entails implanting electrodes in a portion of the brain that is responsible for the abnormal movements and connecting the electrodes to an implanted stimulator. Good candidates for surgery are patients who are generally young and otherwise in good medical condition who are having abnormal movements that are not being well controlled with medication alone. Prior to surgery, we want to ensure that our patients with Parkinson's are levodopa responsive. The expectations of surgery are that we would see improvement in motor function, in particular periods of good on time, with reduction of tremor, bradykinesia, and rigidity. 
After surgery, Dr. Pagan's job is very important because in order for the stimulator to work at an optimum level, it has to be properly adjusted by the neurologist. I'd like to show you a video of a patient who had DBS a few years ago who came in struggling a bit to walk. Then he had his DBS adjusted. It's interesting to see the difference between the before and after. One of the benefits about DBS is that with DBS, we can adjust the stimulation. So we see long-term benefits with our patients. In fact, there's over 22 million different potential settings that we can have. As you saw here in this particular video, our patient was having difficulty walking, having short steps, a little bit of fascination, decreased arm swing. One of the things that I can do in the office, as you're seeing in this particular video, is that I can adjust certain settings like voltage or pulse width, and sometimes, uh, and even frequency of stimulation, and sometimes we can see right there in the office improvements in the patient's motor function. As you're seeing, his, his speed has include, uh, Im improved. He has improvement in bradykinesia. There's a longer stride in the step. His arms are swinging. And this is just uh, during a, a clinical office visit. So initially, we do the programming. And then as we follow the patient over years, we can actually continue to modulate the frequency or the stimulation, et cetera, uh, to help improve the quality of life of that patient. Joining us now are two gentlemen who have had deep brain stimulation surgery or DBS surgery to treat their Parkinson's symptoms. Bill Espinosa, let's start with you. Why did you pursue surgery? Well, I've been a Parkinson's uh, patient since 2006. My Parkinson's started off on the left side and it progressed, uh, I guess, uh, in a normal fashion. Uh, and it was under control using, uh, using drugs until last year. In, by in March and April, I uh, suddenly uh, could no longer uh, control my Parkinson's with drugs, and I ended up uh, being hospitalized. And I actually ended up being locked up where I couldn't move a muscle. I couldn't blink my eyelids. I couldn't swallow. I was I was literally uh, as stiff as uh, as a as a board. And uh, I was uh, transferred to uh, Georgetown University Hospital, and Dr. Pagan took me on as a patient and he uh, found a drug combination that got me unlocked and, uh, and restored some functionality, but not completely, not complete functionality. And he recommended me for deep brain stimulation surgery at that time. If I had not had the surgery, I would have, uh, uh, I would have had to uh, retire, quit my job, and, and my life would have been uh, terrible. So uh, uh, it was a real godsend for me. What types of changes have you noticed uh, in your life since the DBS surgery, or, or what impact do you feel it's had on your, on your family? Well, before the surgery, uh, my life consisted of, uh, of just barely getting to work, do what I needed to do, and come home and, and collapse. Uh, I did no social functions with my family. I didn't go out. I didn't, uh, I mean, life was a, was a, was a drudgery. Uh, after the surgery, I've been able to uh, socialize and, and, and do the normal things that people do in, uh, in American society today. That's great. Uh, Jim O'Connell, you also had DBS surgery. How were your symptoms before surgery, and how do you feel that the surgery has changed your life? Before the surgery, I was having tremendous cramps in my feet. I couldn't even walk around the block. I couldn't walk my dog. I, it was difficult driving. I had a lot of difficulties. I was very tired, as Bill mentioned, all the time. Since then, I've, it's been a turnaround completely. I've, I'm, uh, I'm able to golf. Uh, not well. I'm still not a good golfer. <laughs> but I golf, and I, I've been on zip lines. I've done a lot of things. We, we went to Paris, and I walked all around Paris. It was, uh, you know, it's been tremendous, a big difference in my life. What message uh, would either one, uh, either one of you want to get out to other patients who might be contemplating DBS as a, as a surgical option? Well, I think it, it definitely worked for me, and, uh, and I think it uh, definitely will work for a good number of, uh, of potential candidates. And uh, if, you're, uh, if your Parkinson's has gotten to a, a stage where uh, uh, you're no longer able to function normally, and, uh, and, you, and, and your activities are severely curtailed. You should definitely think about uh, deep brain stimulation surgery. 
If you'd like to learn more about our Movement Disorder Center, or DBS, you can call us at 202-444-2333. We can now start taking your questions. You can ask a question by going to your computer screen or mobile phone, typing a question into the chat box and hitting send. Or if you're watching on Facebook, type your comment in the comment section. One question that patients often ask me is, number one, how, who is a good DBS candidate? So <clears throat> in general, patients who are good candidates for DBS, they should be um, young and otherwise in a good state of health. And oftentimes I'm asked, well, what does that mean, young? And I'd say most of our patients are, are in their mid-60s, and uh, we've even done surgery successfully on, on patients in their mid-80s. So they should be in, in a good state of medical health uh, they should be responsive to levodopa. So we want to make sure that we're dealing with uh, idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And they should have motor symptoms that are not being well controlled with medication. And the motor symptoms that normally respond well to DBS are tremor, rigidity and, or stiffness of movement, bradykinesia or slowness of movement, and dyskinesias. Those are examples of motor symptoms that for most individuals would respond well to DBS. Um, one of the f first questions we have here is, is, how would you work with my current neurologist if I am a candidate for DBS? So maybe, Fernando, you'd like to address that question. So that's a, that's a great question. Uh, at Georgetown University Hospital, uh, we are very willing to work with an individual's neurologist. Uh, we do sometimes get referrals from neurologists who want to see whether or not their patient is a DBS candidate, or sometimes they've already done the workup to, for a patient who is a DBS candidate. So maybe they're movement disorder neurologists who aren't directly affiliated with us. So we can work with the neurologist either way. Sometimes what we'll do is we can do the workup and see whether or not a person is a candidate. We do the deep brain stimulation, we program it, and we can send the patient back to the regular neurologist. And there's some neurologists who are very, very comfortable with, with programming. We'll probably set the DBS uh, stimulator up for them with the first programming, and then they go back to work with their neurologist. We're very willing to work with neurologists in our community. And we have quite a few that we do that with. Our goal is to really establish a, a, a continuum of care where the individual's neurologist is an integral part of of, uh, of what goes on after the surgery. So that's a great question. And, and it's, it's very essential uh, because this is also one of the ways that we can communicate with our, our, our colleagues in the community with some of the up and coming research and some of the newer medications uh, as well. This is a way for us to continue that dialogue and education. And then we're also learning that sometimes doing the window of opportunity, doing the DBS a little bit sooner, not waiting for it to be a last ditch effort, but sometimes when the motor fluctuations begin, when we're seeing more of the dyskinesias or tremor that just hasn't been controlled well with the medications, because we do have tremor-resistant Parkinson's patients out there, that we can probably get them a better quality of life sooner rather than waiting uh, once that window of opportunity is no longer present. Sometimes um, patients will, will ask us, and maybe Fernando, you could comment on this, is what, what type of workup goes into determining whether someone is an appropriate candidate for DBS surgery? So uh, it first starts off with a general history and physical with a neurological exam, reviewing the medications. And uh, oftentimes we'll meet patients who are being adequately treated by their, by their neurologists or or, or by us, but the medicines just aren't lasting long enough. And then here we can start to see, well, how effective are the medications? So oftentimes we'll do something called the dopamine challenge. And both of our patients that are here did undergo that, where we'll see our patients off of medication, give them medicine, and we see the before and after effect. So first, if we can prove that they are levodopa responsive, DBS is just like electrical sentiment for Parkinson's disease. So if you respond to the medication by implanting those stimulators in the right location, it can mimic the effects of the medicine. So that's step number one. Step number two is undergoing a formal neuropsychological testing to ensure that there's not a lot of dementia or cognitive problems that are going to potentially get worse uh, by our surgery or, by our, or, 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 or not be able to be part of the surgery. And then the third part is, of course, seeing you, Dr. Calhoun, uh, to, to ensure that the workup has been done correctly and, uh, and having a discussion with the patient about the risk and benefits of the surgery. In terms of uh, recovery after the surgery, um, 
uh, people ask us sometimes, well, how long will it take to recover from, from DBS surgery? Oftentimes I'm asked that question as well. Uh, what do you generally counsel our patients about their recovery? So uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, and a lot of times the, the patients who get DBS uh, sometimes forget the, the work and effort it took to, to get the best optimal response. But it generally takes about three to six months to see the optimal benefits. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll be interested in probably asking our two guests Ab here. Absolutely, uh, that was my next question. <laughs> uh, because, uh, because one of the things that I do is I work with our patients who have had DBS, how much I can reduce the medication. So there is a manipulations with the medicine, especially during the first three months. And then I'm trying to find the optimal setting that's going to give the best quality of life and the minimal side effects. But that's, uh, but that's a, uh, go ahead and ask that question to our guests. Yeah, maybe, um, you guys could just comment uh, on what your experience was like recovering from DBS. Well, uh, I think I'm still improving. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know what the optimum state is, but I, I, hope it's, uh, I hope it's much more than what I got today and what I have today is, is great. Uh, I would say the f first thing that uh, you notice is all your muscles unlock. And it feels great, but uh, a lot of the muscles have atrophied and when you try to use them, uh, they hurt. Uh, and I was in terrible pain uh, due to muscle problems uh, that ultimately got resolved by uh, physical therapy, uh, again sponsored by uh, Georgetown University Hospital uh, as, part of the, as part of the recovery treatment. And it made a big difference in, in, uh, in my recovery. Uh, so uh, if I hadn't had the physical therapy, uh, while it would still be good, it wouldn't be been as good as with the uh, physical therapy. And I think that really underscores the, <clears throat> the multidisciplinary nature of, of the team that we have at Georgetown, which consists not just of neurosurgeons and neurologists, but also physical therapists and occupational therapists right. and speech therapists to try to treat the whole person. Um, so that's, that's a great uh, that's I would, a great I would also say that uh, uh, the electrical adjustments uh, have not been, I, I had the impression, the incorrect pr impression that, uh, that there would be lots of, lots of adjustments. And in fact, uh, there have been very few adjustments, I think three or four, that's it, in, uh, since August. And most of the adjustments are in your medicine, uh, where you end up taking a much reduced dose of, uh, of uh, carbidopa levodopa than, than, you, than you used to. That's right. I was able to reduce my medicine a great deal. I felt really good right after the surgery. It does take a while to adjust the, the programming to get it just right, but it's uh, once you get it right, it's a completely different feeling than you had before the surgery. And I felt uh, really good right after, right afterwards. And I feel good. So, today. so you really started to notice improvement almost immediately. Almost immediately. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there is some programming to get it just right, but I think uh, once you have it programmed, as Bill said, there, you don't have to change around a lot, and once you have it set, it's pretty well, it's good. Fernando, sometimes patients will ask us, how often does the stimulator need to be adjusted? Uh, there's obviously a, a pretty intense initial adjustment on the settings, and then how often uh, would an individual come back to have the device adjusted on average? That's, that's a great question. One of the things that I've learned over time is that both with medications and DBS stimulation, there's always an immediate benefit and then a long-term benefit. By the same, that by that same token, there could be an immediate side effect or a long-term side effect of certain uh, of certain medications and, and stimulation. So, in general, we make an adjustment, and uh, whether it's with the medication or with the stimulation, and we try to hold that stimulation for about four to six weeks. At that first visit. If I get about a 70 to 80 percent reduction in the tremor or 70 or 80 percent reduction in some of that stiffness or, or that slowness, I know that when I see the patient four to six weeks later, that's going to be much better. Maybe three months later is going to be even better than, than that. So a continuous stimulation there, we continue to see better and better improvements. Uh, and uh, it definitely it involves adjusting the medication, adjusting the, the the voltage or the frequency or the pulse width, whatever we decide is going to be the best optimal uh, setting for that patient. And then 
uh, with the improvement in quality of life, now patients can take uh, place, the, the, the big and loud program, those physical therapy programs. I've always en envisioned it, and one of the analogies I use to some of our patients, if we learn something important when we just sent all these great athletes into the Olympics and they just showed up to play, and we expected them to win the gold medal, but they didn't. Now when we look at the basketball teams that go, they go, they get together for at least four to six weeks before they start playing together with each other. They're great basketball players, but they're in different teams. They've never known how to work closer together. So when we get DBS and adjust the medication, it's like having the dream team, mm -hmm. but we got we to gotta put it all together. And again, looking at the whole person and using our multidisciplinary group, that's where we get the best response. Sometimes people will ask us, well, in terms of adjusting the settings on the stimulator, is there an app for their iPhone or some way of adjusting it that way? And, and uh, so all of our patients get a remote control mm -hmm. that they can actually use to adjust their settings within a certain range and uh, to check and make sure their DBS system is turned on or off. And we also have a programmer that we use all the time uh, in the office, but so far no no app for the iPhone, but maybe that will be forthcoming. Not yet, yeah. <laughs> uh, another question that we're frequently asked is, well, how long uh, d does DBS surgery work for? Um, is there a period of time beyond which DBS is no longer effective? Um, what would you, uh, how would you res respond to that? So I think uh, the number, uh, the, the answer to that, it, it depends on the condition that we're treating, uh, especially with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is, is a neurodegenerative disorder where we, it, this is not a cure, but this is a treatment. But I do have certain patients that we were able to treat patients a lot earlier, and here we are, 11, 12 years later, our patients are still getting a benefit from their DBS that we implanted for that time. I may have had to adjust the medications, uh, uh, go up a little bit more than what we first went, went to 11 years ago, uh, the, the initial reduction we had to go up, uh, but they're still getting clinical benefit from it. Yeah. Other <coughs> conditions like essential tremor uh, as well as dystonia, we have patients where we really haven't had to do much and they've been very stable over, over the years. Uh, and ag again, it, I think it depends on the condition of the patient, what disorder we're dealing, and, uh, and uh, whether it's more advanced or the, uh, if it's a neurodegenerative disorder or not, but clearly we have patients in our clinics now that here we are 11, 12 years plus and they're still getting a clinical benefit. The, the neurostimulator, the implanted uh, pulse generator has a, a finite uh, battery life to it. And uh, to replace that battery uh, requires an outpatient surgery. And sometimes people will ask us, well, how long does a battery uh, last for? And um, if you wanted to comment on that. So again, uh, that, that also, again, there's a lot of variability. In general, most of, most of these uh, pulse generators will last somewhere between three to five years. The good news is for some people who don't last that long, uh, if there is a rechargeable one, and that one can last up to nine years. Uh, so it really depends on how much voltage we need from that stimulator, how frequent, uh, the frequency of the stimulation, or in other words, how strong of a charge we're using to help control that movement disorder. So that can be quite variable, but I have had patients that clearly in that three to five year range is really where the majority of patients do fall into. And now we have rechargeable ones that, and our patients uh, have, are, are lasting much longer with those. Um, Bill, what did you feel like your expectations were leading up to the surgery? Or, or, or what did you feel, uh, what were you expecting to, 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 to have as your result at the end of surgery? And, and do you feel like your expectations were met by the surgery? Well, I, I researched the uh, DBS surgery uh, procedure and uh, uh, quite extensively and, and also looked up uh, patients who had had DBS and, and, and read their, their write-ups of, of, uh, of this uh, procedure. So I, I went in with my eyes sort of open on DBS uh, and uh, I expected some improvement uh, in, in capability, but uh, actually uh, what I got was a lot more than I had anticipated. So uh, I'm very happy and very pleased with what, what occurred. That's great. And Jim, do you feel like your expectations also were, were met in terms of the surgery? They were exceeded by a great deal. When I, when I came in, I was afraid I was going to have to lose my job or retire or something. 
and I, I, as I say, I couldn't walk very well, and now everything seems turned around. I'm, I'm feeling better than I ever have, really, That's in my life. It's, it's fantastic. Do either one of you use your remote control to adjust your settings depending on your level of activity? Say, if you have a public speaking engagement, or you want to go out and right and ride that zip line do do either one either one of you uh, yeah, either one of you do that I, I don't I don't change my uh, setting uh, very often at all uh, maybe I've only done it about twice in, in the year since I've had it so uh, I don't I don't do it very often How about you Bill no uh, I go through a protocol where I if I'm feeling off I I check my meds and maybe adjust my meds um, and <laughs> it's only after that that I consider adjusting the, the voltage. I've only done that, uh, well, uh, early on when I had a lot of pain uh, due to muscle problems, muscle atrophy problems where I needed the physical therapy, um, uh, the medicines weren't helping to make the pain go away, so I, I tried adjusting the voltage and it had no effect. Um, uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, once the muscle problems went away, um, I haven't had the, I haven't felt the need to adjust the voltage uh, for any activity. Well, one concern um, a number of people have is, is is deep brain stimulation surgery covered by most commercial insurance carriers and and because this technology is FDA approved, uh, it is covered um, by uh, Medicare and most commercial insurance coverage plans. So that's that's frequently a concern that people have. I think people are also concerned about the immediate after effects of the surgery and how difficult it is to recover and the right away, you know, right after the surgery. <coughs> Mine was almost immediate. I was out of the hospital within 24 hours and feeling really good right afterwards. So I think people shouldn't be afraid of the brain surgery. Uh, it's not. It's not that bad. It's not a difficult surgery to recover from at all. Bill, can you tell us a little bit about the exercises that you do in the morning? <laughs> or <laughs> what's your well, what's your uh, regimen? Well, I, I, it's twofold. Uh, to start off with, uh, uh, you exercise uh, large muscle groups to get the muscle memory going, uh, similar to the way. Uh, you know, for, well, for instance, let's let's talk about like walking and gait and arm swing. Uh, you know, doctors such as yourselves uh, can immediately spot a Parkinson's patient uh, a mile away because uh, a typical Parkinson's patient doesn't walk with a normal gait, doesn't walk with a normal arm swing. Uh, th there's something um, um, stiff about the way way a Parkinson's patients walk. Uh, after the DBS and with the with the uh, uh, with the physical therapy, uh, I developed a normal gait and a normal arm swing and. Uh, and I've uh, had uh, quite a lot of success. Now I spend about an hour a day doing a, s a specific set of exercises. Uh, they're called big because uh, they're big arm movements, big leg movements, uh, big torso movements. Uh, but think of it like a, like a set of calisthenics. It takes about an hour to do. Then I also do what's called a loud program, which is supposed to w work on your larynx uh, and, uh, and improve your voice uh, because if you take a, take a look, uh, uh, Jim speaks with a softer voice than I do, uh, and I would attribute that to the loud program, where I, I had the loud program where you, you, you make loud sounds uh, in, a, in a certain sequence, uh, and the whole thing is designed to uh, improve, your, improve your voice. Uh, and, and it's called loud because they want you to speak out loud. Mm -hmm. Jim, what kind of changes did you notice in your in your body after DBS? Uh, the stiffness in my arms and legs had really disappeared or almost completely. Uh, I was able to drive again when I, my arms would feel heavy when I was driving before the surgery, and now I feel great. I that's, drive all over. That's outstanding. Yeah. Um, a reminder that this uh, webcast has been recorded so that you can watch it again on the MedStar Georgetown website, YouTube channel, or link through our Facebook page. If you have questions about deep brain stimulation or movement disorders, here's the number for our department, 202-444-2333. I'd like to thank Dr. Pagan, and especially our guests, Bill Espinosa and Jim O'Connell, for sharing their DBS experiences with us. Thanks for watching. <laughs>